suicidal to the suicidal ideation of an Iraq war veteran in the opera Fallujah, a film shown on PBS in 2012, to the restless longings of an Iraqi refugee architect in Nura, 2018, a film adaptation of nine parts released on PBS in 2023 is a radical reimagining of her groundbreaking play from the vantage point of 20 years after the war. Hamid Sino is a composer, writer, performer, and social justice advocate. They have been the lyricist and front person for Mashu Leila since 2008, engaging conversations around representation, free speech, gender justice, and sexual freedom in the Middle East. Hamed has a BFA from the Department of Architecture and Design at the American University of Beirut and an MA in Digital Music from Dartmouth College, where they analyzed the vocal organ and digital vocality as sites of political negotiation. Whoa. Their solo debut, Poems of Consumption, opened at London's Barbican Theatre Centre in July 2023. Okay. Junaid Sariadine is a theatre actor, director, dramaturg, and a founding member of Beirut-based company Zukak Theatre, and a member of the Sundance Board of Trustees since 2000, October 2019. He has directed several theater plays with Zukak and other artists, such as Raida Taha's 36 Abbas Street Haifa in 2017. As a dramaturg, Junaid worked on several theater and dance performances and performed in more than 20 productions in the past 14 years, touring in multiple cities and festivals around the world. Since 2016, he has been a fellow artist of the Sundance Theater Program, where he took part in various theater labs both as a director and as a dramaturg in the U.S. and in the MENA region. Welcome, everybody. It's so wonderful to see your beautiful faces. Thank you for taking part in this panel. Um, I, be, oh, yeah, before we uh, start our conversation, actually, I want to take a moment to welcome people who are joining us here in person in San Francisco and also in the Zoom room, uh, but also those who are tuning into the live stream on HowlRound. Um, those here with us uh, on Zoom, please feel free to utilize the chat function to post your comments and questions throughout the conversation. Okay, beautiful. Here we are. And I have some questions for y'all. So I'm going to get started. Here we go. Andrea, I would like to know, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about your relationship to your culture of origin and what that culture's impact has been on your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Did you hear me, Andrea? Um, you didn't hear me. I'll say that again. I would love to know a little about your culture of origin and its impact on your work, on your creative work. Aha. Okay. I will come back to you, Andrea. Okay. No worries. I will come back. All right. Um, how about, uh, let's talk to with Junaid first. Um, I'm going to just read something that refers back to your description of the work that you do. Um, establishing Zukak has provided Junaid a broad experience in art direction, curating cultural events and festivals, in addition to the knowledge in the management of non-governmental and cultural associations on the national, regional, and international contexts. He was a member of several initiatives focusing on cultural policies and other social and cultural issues in Lebanon, including censorship, public space, cultural heritage, and history. Can you talk a little about your experience addressing these concerns um, in either your work with Zukap or your work with Sundance? Um, and we want to hear how that came about, by the way, how you got involved with Sundance. But if you could talk about how your creative work um, has, you know, giving you the opportunity to address these issues. Uh, absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be with you all. Uh, so my name is Junaid Saridin. I'm from Zvakak Theatre Company. I'm speaking to you now from Beirut, from a, like around 282 kilometers away from Gaza, or 176 miles from there. I would like to acknowledge first that Gaza tonight is under massive, massive, massive attack 
and a lot of people are uh, uh, facing death and horror. So uh, to answer your question, I would like to give just a bit like of a short background because everything we do in life is because of our history. I was born in 1982 during the a war in Lebanon and during the an Israeli invasion. I was born a few days after the Israeli invasion uh, uh, in Lebanon. I survived twice when I was a kid, like once uh, two uh, strikes and bombings from the Israeli army. Once when I was three days old and another when I was two months old. And then uh, my mother uh, uh, left the country and followed my father to Saudi Arabia, where they ra raised us first as kids. And then we ran away from the Gulf War there and we came back after the end of the war in Lebanon. So me and my uh, colleagues in Zukak, we, will, we were all born in, in the same area during the war. But our our political consciousness and uh, conscience was uh, formed during the post-war era, which is the 90s and the early 2000s. So in that period, it was a period of amnesty, a period of reconstruction, a period of post-war era that we have we had a lot of issues to deal with, like history, memory, and uh, 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 to fill the gaps in our our uh, all in in history and justice, so we formed Zukak as a collective in order to uh, survive as individuals as well, in order to build a body that can hold us as individuals to for the continuity of our work and the accumulation of experiences, and because it was the only way to deal with uh, um, our socio political challenges in the world. We believe in theater as a political action, a political and a wider spectrum of understanding. And this is how we, uh, we, we feel that as political beings, because we are beings that are facing, since we were born, we're facing uh, threats on our lives. These threats comes from different perspectives and different ideologies and different uh, circumstances. And so we are political beings that we have no luxury to be working on any other thing but uh, uh, essential questions that are about the individual and uh, collectives. So uh, since then, we ha we in Zukak tackled a lot of topics through theater, like related to gender, um, death, uh, gender, death, violence, history, and religion and power. And all these questions were at the core of our practice. Uh, uh, during that period also, like since the early 2000s, the political or the security troubles in Lebanon came back because it seems that there was a deal in the region and that deal was came to an end and the assassination of Prime Minister Hariri at, back at then in 2005, like or four, it drove us into a new uh, time of chaos. When we founded Zukak in 2006, another Israeli war happened in, Le in Lebanon, took place. It was also massive. We found ourselves uh, going with our theater uh, work to uh, uh, displaced people and working with uh, all the displaced, like offering theater as a space of connection. And, and, and that's how we developed also a big uh, trajectory of work in the psychosocial field and drama therapy. And during that time, after that, in parallel to all these external threats, we have our internal issues that we had to deal with, like all the sectarian politics in Lebanon and all the marginalization, marginalizing systems. And these were the main, our own focus. So as an individual, I, I in order to build also an understanding for the theater practice, I have to be, you know, aware of like the the context I'm giving the, within the history, the system, and this is what drove me into understanding and researching and working with groups, and and uh, like sometimes political activism and sometimes only research groups in order to just uh, build a kind of understanding to to the context, the history of the context, and. What are the possible uh, what are the possible alternatives that we could uh, uh, you know promote or work for uh, from this place? That's a um, yeah. So that all came from that uh, um, trajectory of 
yeah mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. and context it's so important to have that background thank you so much Junaid. and uh, i'll come back to you in a moment but first i'm hoping yeah. andrea uh has a good connection now is it are you good andrea i think, I think we're back yes thank you oh, excellent excellent uh so what i had uh, uh asked and would love to know about is your relationship to your culture of origin and what that culture's impact has been on your creative work here in the States. Thank you, it's a great question. I also wanna be begin by acknowledging, um, was, you know, I'm here at, at, at Golden Thread at the Manatma convening that's happening. And we have been um, acknowledging both um, the indigenous people of the lands here and also the genocide that's currently happening in Palestine. And we wanna acknowledge um, the painful truth of uh, settler colonialism in the United States, but also um, the parallel uh, with what's going on in, in, in Palestine and Israel right now and, and even in Southern Lebanon. And uh, we mourn the loss of all the, all the innocent people being killed, but we condemn also the violence and terrorism in all forms as well as uh, the apartheid system and uh, the condemnation of Israel's illegal and military occupation since 1967 um, in in Palestine, and uh, we've been making a real commitment to um, keep saying that throughout our gathering, <laughs> and uh, so to to honor that commitment, I wanted to read uh, that part of the acknowledgement as well. Thank you. Um, but back to your question, um, I, I grew up actually quite isolated from any Arab community or identity uh, here in the United States. I'm, uh, you know, my grandfather and his father came from Lebanon uh, and my father was born in Buffalo and I was born in Virginia and uh, lived part of my life in rural Pennsylvania where there was no Arab community to speak of whatsoever. And so it's really been very much a part of my adult life as an artist, a very intentional investigation into cultural heritage and aesthetics um, that's really driven much of my work since 9-11. Uh, I was a New Yorker in 9-11 and experienced it both as a New Yorker and, as an, and, and then immediately experienced the anti-Arab and Islamophobic backlash that resulted literally, literally overnight. And um, and and it's and it's and it's shaped my work. It's shaped my work for the rest of my life. Um, that uh, shift in, in in how I experience my own identity as an Arab American, because you know, I, I would say pre nine eleven, particularly being Lebanese, was quite um, cosmopolitan and maybe a little cool, <laughs> exotic even. And then uh, immediately became uh you know everyone who remotely looked arab whatever that means was uh public enemy number one of the united states you know and as soon as we entered certainly into the era of the the wars on, on afghanistan and iraq so um so it was quite it's been a, quite an intentional um process of reclamation through collaboration collaborating with artists from the region and also from the diaspora here. And, and certainly I've been influenced by Heather's work very deeply um, and, uh, and, 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 all, and the work of many of the artists who are here uh, at the Manatma convening now um, online and in person. So maybe I'll stop there and, and we'll talk more. Uh, okay. Yes, definitely. I'll come back to you. I have some specific questions based on what you just said. And by the way, I mostly grew up in Buffalo. Okay, so we'll talk later. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Hamid, Hamid, you know, you're the original leader, singer, songwriter for Mashulela. And I have to tell you that having introduced the work of the band and your play, to my students, they're all kind of madly in love with you. I thought you ought to know that. Um, it's a burden, but you know, I'm sure you can deal with it. Um, Such a burden. <laughs> now you're based in the US, you're a poet, you're a playwright. Um, and I'm, I guess my first question, and there will be more, 
are the challenge is about the challenge of being a high profile successful professional musician who identified as and identifies as queer in Lebanon how does life differ here for you and what are the challenges now because i'm sure there are challenges uh to being who you are and living life the way you have done um but is it the same as in Lebanon or different right um so I mean, because this actually ties into to my answer, I would like to also start by acknowledging that there is an ongoing genocide in, in Palestine. It's been ongoing since 1948, um, and that we are currently on Lenape land. I'm currently on Lenape land and would typically like to grovel for the Lenape's future mercy when this land inevitably is returned to its rightful stewards because all empire will end. Um, but... Um, Otherwise, I mean, look, I, I don't particularly sort of identify as a playwright. I think I'm someone who just falls into things quite often. Dude, to write. I read your play, okay? So. I mean, I'm not I'm not trashing the play, right? I just, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is my vocation in life, right? I'm currently working on an opera. Um, I just released a song cycle. Like, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm good. I'm okay at doing a lot of things and not great at doing any one thing at any one time. But right. um, I think... I think part of what happens when when you are identifiably queer and from the Middle East is that a lot of people from this region, unfortunately, take interest in your work in a way that that goes sort of past tokenization and becomes more about um, being able to levy your work against your own sort of political intentions, right? So suddenly your victimization as a queer person becomes a justification for empire. And I've seen this kind of pinkwashing discourse suffocatingly sort of omnipresent in, in online discourse around Palestine over the last three weeks in particular, for example. And it's, it, you know, that was, that was always there when I was touring the US as a musician. Um, and so I do feel this weird sort of tension here where as someone who is not a proponent of cultural relativism, I find it very difficult to to sort of try to negotiate between wanting to be explicitly critical of sort of the institutional homophobia where I was raised, but also wanting to be able to speak of that here in English without, without providing imperialism with language, if that makes sense. Um, and and it's really tricky, this, this, this constant feeling of like having, feeling like you're being watched Right by someone who wants to tag on to anything that you say that isn't perfectly seasoned and balanced, and use that to skew a narrative. Um, and I'm I'm not I'm not fully sure that I've resolved that yet. I think the the play that has been showing with Golden Thread is actually very much just about that. Um, it's really like me hiding behind my thumb, going, "No, no, this character isn't mine. They're a dancer. It's on me." Um, and very much just me thinking out loud about political questions that have been sort of haunting me since I started performing here. Um, and I, I, I can't answer that yet. I don't know what the right answer is. I think there is a world in which there is value to ignoring the question of audience for a bit, or particu particularly ignoring the question of, of the white gaze, to be honest, um, and sort of just saying your part and, and not feeling responsible for other people's racism. Um, Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer, but not at all. I, that makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay, uh, I'll come back to you in a minute. But first, um, I would like to um, uh, ask. Well, Heather. Okay, so the stories that led to the creation of Nura emerged in a series of workshops for Arab American women that you led in New York. The workshops inspired you to write and star in Nora, a 90 minute piece about loss, displacement and the breakdown of communities. For me, I think one of the most effective plays about immigrant life that I have ever experienced. So thank you for that. Um, and also I have a, a quote here from you for the part of an interview that you gave. We as Americans have the potential to make the people living next door, whether they are a, whether they have been here for generations or are new immigrants or refugees, feel like they fundamentally belong to the fabric of this nation, both in our policy and in our personal interactions. 
And I, that's your quote. And I, I would just love you to just expand on that a little bit and, and talk about your passion for illuminating the immigrant experience. And I mean, we, you know, we're starting with the communities that we come from, but I can't help but feel that especially you and Jeanne and Andrea are also working intersectionality, intersectionally uh, with other communities. And I, that's fascinating to me. And I just would love to hear a little bit about what got you started on putting those immigrant stories together and how they inspired you to write Nura. Hi, all. Um, I'm Heather. I'm really grateful to be here today. And um, I also want to start with an acknowledgement on behalf of the violence that's being perpetrated in our name. I would say that particularly as Americans, but also because this room is just so special and this community is so special. And I know I just want to acknowledge what we're holding. Um, I offer that because I've had some like, I've had health issues this year and I've realized maybe for the first time, like how, how heavy it is on our bodies, our psyches, our souls to be um, carrying and trying to rectify and trying to speak and trying to champion and trying to bridge um, as artists, as humans, all the ways that we do and how much even just gathering in community is, is both healing for that, but also the place we can finally come and lay down our baggage for a second, right? So um, I, just, I feel that really profoundly in this moment, how, um, how great that is. And I'll start by saying that um, I'm Iraqi American. My dad was an immigrant. I was brought up in Michigan and I, I think I didn't much know what my sense of belonging or identity really was until the first Iraq war in the nineties hit. And I was 20 at the time and I'm 53 now. So I would say that since, since that awakening at 20, it's been 30 years of, of nonstop war, <laughs> really, right? And it, it would be, I was in also New York when 9-11 happened. It's, it, would be, um, it would be nice every time I think as an artist, I'm gonna move into some other territory something else comes, right? That is just so massive that I have to put everything down to um, to be where we're at. So I'd say that yes, war has completely defined me um, and who I am and what, what my reason for um, creating art is um and for the longest time i felt i was bridging an iraqi american divide and voice during during an actual war like in days where you couldn't speak where anybody that said anything that may be said from an iraqi point of view was was canceled right? Or was it was not allowed on our stages and before there was even a genre of Middle Eastern American theater. Like, so those, those days, I know we're all feeling similar things now. So I bring it up to say like 20 years ago, it was, it was not a given that we could do plays about the Middle East. They weren't, they were not on our main stages. They fundamentally were not allowed. And nine parts was you net, you know, we we can we can make a nice quote about things now where it was received or whatever, but like it was unanimously turned down by every theater in the United States that I submitted it. And this was for a reading, for a give me a workshop in your basement, not put me on your biggest main stage. So so like where we've come is is still mighty as we're getting to this point of what we're speaking. But um, so Nora, 
Nora did come out of um, four years of workshopping with um, Middle Eastern women in Queens, New York. Um, some of them were born in the Middle East. Some of them were born here. And it was a grant that was designed to build a demand for theater in the Arab American community of New York. So the goal was not to go into a community that had theater or was ever even going to theater, but to go to a, a subset of the community that saw no value in it, that maybe had never even cared to see a play, right? Um, so in, in working in this community over time, um, one thing that kept coming to the surface was the issue of individualism versus community. And I think that that's something in America in particular we were, we struggle with. We are a rugged individualist society and that's unsustainable, <laughs> right? And capitalism, it's, it's just all unsustainable. Right, and to experience um, Middle Eastern women navigating a both a desire to um, do whatever the hell they wanted <laughs> sometimes on their own without having to take their entire family and community with them, but pitting that against um, a love for community and knowing we have to take our community with us. Um, so that was kind of the um, one of the initial seeds of what Nora came out of, but the other seed was about um, the lengths one goes to survive and what belonging really is. And I think when we think about belonging and identity and immigrants experiences, you know, so many think of us as, oh, we're bridging two cultures or are we assimilating or are we not? Are we carrying our, you know, like these, Americana immigrant stories. But what I was encountering were a leaving of home that was so harrowing, it rendered one unrecognizable even to oneself. And how far survival might push us and how far divisions might go. And these were see these were themes that kept coming in the midst of watching the fabric of the United States dealing with a sense of polarization and questions around belonging that were as hot as they've ever been. So I would say that my career, my interest, my heart started at 20 in Michigan and university when the first war happened. And then after 30 years now living in New York um, and writing about Iraq and America as like trying to be a bridge builder of that conversation, I have really turned focus toward um, my home state of Michigan. Um, I'm working out of the Arab American National Museum a lot. I'm working in as many, I'm at University of Michigan now, but I just, Michigan is a swing state. Um, my feeling is that swing state voters create policy that impacts the entire world. And their lives are connected to lives of everyone across the world in ways they do not realize. And these heat, these very hot conversations are, 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 aren't where artists are naturally leaning in in our nation because artists get pulled to the coasts um, for, for legitimate career reasons, right? Especially in the theater, you get pulled to New York, right? So I, I just feel with my entire being that I understand something about that state. I need to be in conversation with it. Um, I need to be um, working both in the Arab community there, but in, in many different kinds of community there, and that it might be the most diverse place I've ever worked. You know, Heather, you just kind of jumped to what my follow-up question was going to be, which is, 
you've talked about why you um, have set, you set the film in Michigan. Brilliant. And could you talk even a little more specifically about the exact location, which is Flint, which is such a, I don't know, it's such a painful and um, complex circumstance that those folks have been dealing with, whether they're part of the Arab community or not. Just the, the water problem, just so many different things happening in that state. And I'm just wondering what brought you to that specific area by way of, you know, making the global local or the local global. I don't know what you did, but go, talk about that just for a minute. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I had this amazing opportunity to create a film of, of Nine Parts of Desire, which was exclusively about Iraqi women um, during, during the pandemic. And so the natural choice would to set the film on location in the Middle East. But, um, I was in Michigan, um, looking after my mother with bringing my kids, my husband to, right. I was there for nine months and I knew that I had to set the conversation there. Um, and so it became why, like, why is this gut instinct? What, what is the reason for this gut instinct, right? And um, Flint is the home of the oldest Iraqi church in all of North America. And that church happens to sit on the banks of the Flint River. So that felt like the answer, even though the answer is deeper than that. So I would, I would say that one of the reasons is because when I first wrote the play, I had almost a hundred family members living in New York. Hold on one second. <laughs> I just made sure they knew everything they were saying would be heard on Zoom for half the world. Anyway, um, so my, my 100 family members that had been in Iraq for, it, there are, our um, ancestors for thousands of years were now scattered across the globe. I have one cousin left living in Iraq. So this sense of, the story I was telling about people that were in Iraq, for me personally, was a story about people that had been, are now in diaspora. And this church is built by people in diaspora. But, um, the particulars of what of this church that is so beloved and so well cared for is that it is in a community that was once thriving and economically very successful and that now is so forgotten and so destroyed that anybody walking through it would call it a war zone. I mean, there are burned out homes, it is rubble, there are people living in extreme poverty. And it is unmistakable to me personally that, I mean, the Iraq war could be um, whittled down to oil from an American point of view, right? And why oil? Because of the car industry. And Flint, like this church on the other side of the river are the closed down GM Chrysler plants. Like it was just the, the, the levels of interconnectedness felt very great. And I also just wanted um, any American watching the film to, instead of watching something about Iraqis over there or the war from 20 years ago, for them to constantly feel that the, the the thing that was right next to them, the divisions they're feeling with their neighbors, the reasons like the the implications of what it meant to be American in that war that we led and that the costs are here now. We brought the costs over there. We did it. And, and then we brought the costs home and now we have to face them. Thank you so much, Heather. I remember our first conversation about your, you were going to make the film. We were speaking on the phone and I just, I could, I actually, after I got off the phone, I couldn't stop thinking about exactly what you said, a briefer version of what you've just said. 
uh, about setting it in Michigan. So thank you so much for that. Um, and by the way, when I was a child, I, I haven't spent much time in Michigan. Uh, actually, my husband grew up there, but my only times in Michigan were at Hofla's in Detroit. We, we would just go to parties, you know, and then we'd get in the car and drive home, whatever. Um, so, uh, Hamid, I'm going to come back to you. I'm um, particularly uh, struck by this project that um, is described in your bio, um, where you analyzed the vocal organ and digital vocality as sites of political negotiation. Okay, my head is exploding. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, this is perhaps less identitarian and more um, more a, a, a Marxist analysis, which I'm- I'm okay with that. Which, I, which I'm biased towards, but um, by four rather. Um, I um, the history of, of speech synthesis, for example, is deeply tied with um, America's attempt to disappear the working class, right? So from the get-go, Bell Labs um, expressed that their intention for for wanting to create artificial voices, and this is back in the 30s, was to do away with the need for phone operators, right? So suddenly these jobs that are typically done by people using their bodies, right, start to disappear. And obviously we've seen that with the way industrialization has evolved over the last, you know, however many decades um, with the reduction of working class jobs and then the pushback. Um, and for me, vocality itself, I mean, the voice, and maybe this is because I've, I've, I've always been a singer, but um, I feel like the voice is, is really just one of those miracles of, of, of the human body um, where especially for a body that is expected to hide, right? The idea that you could sort of publicly take in air, right? Draw in from this sort of collective life force that we share and use this sort of abject flesh prison, right? To, to create something that's that's beautiful and that is essentially signifying that language is is an inadequate conduit of meaning right there's there's a surplus of meaning that happens when you're singing words instead of speaking them um and it really does sort of gesture the body towards the ineffable and when that comes from a from a sort of otherwise abject body it's 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 just i don't know it gets me all like hot and ready to be honest um sorry that sounds really daft but it is what it is um and i, I think something really interesting happens when you when you take that organ and try to attach it to AI, right, or to a machine. Um, and what that does is not always necessarily a bad thing, right? It, there's there's all sorts of sort of transgendered, transing of the voice that happens through AI and through speech synthesis. Um, there's, there's a lot of room for play, but there's also, as with every technological advancement, a lot of room for quashing resistance and, and disappearing it. Um, and so that was sort of where my research was going. And, and part of the opera that I'm working on right now for January is using a, a cloned version. So I, I cloned my voice into a speech generator that sort of operates like a Siri version of my voice that I sort of perform with. Um, it speaks, it doesn't sing, um, but um, the line between those two forms of vocalization is, is at best negotiable, debatable, uh, if you ask me, but anyway. Um, did, did I answer your question? Sorry, I tend to get... Well, it, it definitely, uh, you know, um, breaks the ice for me because I, I had no idea what you were talking about. And now I have a little bit of an idea of what you're talking about. Um, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Now, how did the opera come about? I'm, I'm curious, um, how did how, this production, can you tell us just briefly how that, what happened? Uh, what happened is I, I stopped being able to write music for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I had a career that uh, exposed me to, and this isn't this isn't like a victim narrative. I'm great. I live in New York. I'm my first commission is with the Met. My life is killing it right now, right? I'm I'm just gonna preface that before I trauma dump, right? <laughs> but but I, I I did have a sort of disproportionate amount of um of of, of trauma uh, that I was forced to go through because of my work and because of being identifiably queer and Muslim in the public eye in the Middle East and here for a while. Um, 
And um, and so for, for a while, I just stopped being able to to write songs because whenever I'd you know open a word document, it felt like uh, before I've even written anything, I know I'm gonna get in trouble, right? Like I could say it's snowing, and some Christian fundamentalist in North Lebanon is gonna decide that snow is code for cocaine, and that this is my like devil worship, right? And this is my indoctrination of the children. Dead ass, like that is how things were working. Uh, I can't believe I just said dead ass. I'm 35 years old. Um, so I, I I stopped writing songs for a while. I went back to grad school, accidentally took a playwriting class, and then found myself really sort of drawn to to, to musical theater um, because it felt like so much of what I was doing as a performer on stage, sort of presenting an audience with this persona of like, oh, here is a body that deserves to be on stage. Look, I'm going to be a rock star now for the next hour and a half before I go home and like binge on Taco Bell and cry about being alone, right? Um, and that was very much a, a character that I was synthesizing for an audience. And it felt like, it felt like theater at some point. Um, and so I started writing in that form. And I think the line between musical theater and opera can be defined when the person defining that line is willing to say that opera in its current definition is necessarily a racialized form. And so I'm using the term opera just to piss off a bunch of people that don't acknowledge that um, and to get that kind of funding, to be completely honest. Um, but yeah, does that answer? Yes. Yes, yes. yes, thank you. I was really curious how that came about. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, uh, Jeanette, I wanted to come back to you. I, you know, um, I think one of the things that uh, has impressed me most about your work and, and Zukok's work um, has been the way that, um, you have reached out into the world in a huge way, all of you, um, you know, Europe and the United States and all over the place, but you have such a uh, um, sharp focus on Lebanon and different communities in Lebanon. And you have a, the, a great deal of the effort on the part of the company, uh, I think, is on it, interacting with those various communities and getting their stories. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, our our uh, uh, our work is very contextual. Like we connect because our aim is to work on all these systems of marginalization. So, as like we work with marginalized groups that are identified in different ways in Lebanon, like as. Uh, refugees, migrant, uh, domestic workers, uh, um, queer communities, uh, and etc. So, and mainly in Lebanon, there are like the challenges are on different levels, of course, like on the socio political spectrum. So, our as individuals living, we have our political and economical uh, challenges that we need to deal with, but also on the social level, we have issues that are related to religion, sex, and politics in general. These, and these are the three main areas where you have uh, censorship on it. Either this censorship comes from, um, from the government or from the uh, social groups uh, in Lebanon. So, and through that, you can see what, what are the topics that that shakes the system in a way and shakes the consensus and the and how the system is formed. So working with people allows us to connect with the different actualities and how we can um, uh, how we can understand a more complex uh, uh, speech and discourse to our work and content as well because it is easy to deal with issues like from a theory, theoretical point of view or from also only your own point of view. But when we, you when you go and meet people living in different uh, economical situation, people who doesn't have your own privileges, mm -hmm. to, the people who don't have access to culture and to your economic uh, 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 privileges, then you see different perspectives and then you need to start to find a way to deal with issues from a more complex way and we believe in theater as a place of like of a, a place of paradox of complexity and of criticism a a place where you can 
think and generate questions. And this is how we um, we we learned a lot from the from communities. And we go to work with communities not because we want to help them. We don't help anyone because we want to help ourselves. It's because we it's it's for us because it's a way to survive first to survive to connect to 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 uh, and to and to be um, you know and to be in a uh, uh, not living in a uh, 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 utopia or a la la land you know because uh, yeah life life is not a dream life is dreams are part of life you know we can dream of a lot of things but life is life life is what we are seeing today of the of ugliness of death of destruction and of impossibilities as well and you can meet these impossibilities when you meet people who are living on the edge you know like people who are living on the edge are people who you can listen to and learn to are not people that they need your help on a cultural level they are they are people who you need like we have the tools to maybe channel uh, their narratives and stories because we have the privilege of being on a stage we have a privilege of being able to have a platform of a spe of speech yes of course we worked a lot to create that platform for example in zukak we 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 really worked hard like since 18 years when we founded zukak we didn't have a space we didn't have a studio we didn't have a place to rehearse we didn't have any money like in Lebanon. You don't have any government support for arts and culture in general. So we had to work. Uh, and But since we have that, we have a responsibility. And this responsibility comes through only our tools. It's like we started on all of this like in 2006, as, when, as I said, like when during the war in the first two days, three days, five days, we started to... You know, we went and we started on the, like, the basic needs on first aid. Like, you know, we started to help groups and uh, providing people with with food, water, matrices, etc. And then after five, six days, when all the uh, activists and groups were, like, already functioning, then we said, let's let's start to do what we know, how to, what we know how to do, is like to do theater. And this is how it started. And then we continued working after the war for two years with the people who lost uh, um, their parents, their relatives, their friends, or their homes, or their schools. So we did a big work with uh, in the South in different schools and uh, with the children and teenagers. And then in 2000. And seven, we had a, a war in a Palestinian refugee camp in the uh, north. So also there we had a lot, a whole camp were displaced into another camp and we worked there. And then we had the, you know, like we worked with Iraqi refugees, then Syrian refugees, Sudan refugees. And then we worked uh, uh, with also different centers that worked with refugees in uh, Europe and one uh, unforgettable experience was in Calais camp where we we'll, like uh, in in borders like uh, between Paris between uh, France and uh, uh, UK there uh, uh, in the Calais camp we spent like we went for two years to work there and uh, one of the uh, works were uh, during um, the New Year's Eve. And uh, yeah, I mean, I can't, uh, I mean, that was, I mean, you see people in their real um, uh, uh, thrives or, uh, you know, their real, they, their fight for finding dignity and life. And same people in the news and media, they look at them as, yeah, as I don't know, as as animals, like they're saying now. So it's like, yeah, I mean, this is what uh, you learn from people is like the, yeah, the main uh, values of life, and it reminds you to yeah work on these values. Sorry, I sound a bit emotional or something, but 
I mean, Please. the situation don't, don't now is, yeah. is really very, very intense and um, anxiety is uh, really like shaking us on all levels. And it also brings us to ask the, I mean, essential questions, you know, like that we ask ourselves. And it always reminds us like, yeah, like if now we are going to do theater, like people ask us like, I mean, yeah, are you still opening the theater while people are dying in Gaza? And then we say, yes, of course. I mean, it's difficult to carry that here emotionally and physically and to go to the theater and to do music parties and to do open theater and to do programs with the, with the, the we have a mentorship program that is running now with the artists and like, and to do theater and sometimes pieces that are talking about different topics. But yes, we hold this responsibility and we hold our bodies and emotions in order to face the 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 situation. And this is how this country have survived also through through uh, the past uh, hundred years. It's like also through art and through the love of like art and culture and singing and music. You see, during the worst days of the past wars in Lebanon, you have families gathering at homes and singing and uh, drinking alcohol and, you know, and yeah, and this is this is what we want to do. And plus, we are like, art is our profession. So, I mean, and it's the only profession that gets questioned in such times, you know, like, I mean, why no one asked a butcher to close the shops or a mechanic? or a person in the media who works in the media or a journalist or a lawyer like ask them or or a doctor or whatever like art is as essential as a place as the only places of like communal places people were pe people were who like gathers there and meet each other and they share their share they share their emotions they share the way how they are living the situations and uh yeah so this is what we're dealing now with Absolutely. at the same time. You know, if you wouldn't mind, just um, finish yeah. by telling us about this mentorship program that you're doing right now. Who, who yeah, are the sure. people involved? So we have a program called Kawalis Zukak, which is Zukak behind the curtains. It's like a, a program for practitioners to, to um, like it's a training program and a mentorship program. And every year we choose like people uh, artists apply and this year we have six artists who were selected with six different uh, uh, theater plays actually and uh, so the the program ran for eight months and uh, this week is the presentation week of the of the uh, performances and it's amazing because we have six new young artists who have, who worked on text and directing and like they composed a whole play and also all all like engaged um very uh like their topics they are working uh uh on they are like um really uh strong like they are also dealing with issues related to you know to the to what they it's it's the generation who who lived the past this past period in lebanon like the the economic collapse, the revolutions, the the huge, massive Beirut explosion, the those um, artists who like their profession and life is like they were in university or like on in school, and then um, the the country collapsed again. Mm -hmm. So they find their their questions in life are also on the edge, and yeah, it's I'm. We're so happy with this. I mean, it's well, every time in the theater is like it's always full, and people are really calm discussing. It's like it's like never before. People are talking about art and like discussing. So the topic. Sounds, I wish I were there. I really wish I was there. Yeah, um, yeah. It's good that you're not. I mean, like <laughs> stay away a bit. It's better now. <laughs> But I understand, yes. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I'm going to turn to uh, Andrea again in just one second. But just as a reminder, yes. uh, uh, um, for those who tuned in late to the conversation, this is MENA Theater Makers Alliance convening an annual national meeting that amplifies the voices of Middle Eastern and North African theater makers. Um, 
And we are in conversation with Junaid Sariuddin, Heather Raffo, Hamad Sino, and Andrea Asaf. And uh, it's, you know, just uh, really remarkable because the title of this panel is uh, MENA Political Theater at Home and in the Diaspora. And you could not be talking more brilliantly to that topic. So thank you all so much. Andrea, okay. I, first of all, I, I want to know, a, a, there are a couple of things that I would love you to talk about. One of them is the ways in which art to action and your work in particular, well, I guess art to action is a, an organization that encompasses several different communities, correct? So I'd love to hear yes. more about what's happening there. Are they, uh, the, those communities, are some of them immigrant communities as well? And then two, um, I definitely want to hear about 11 reflections on the nation, definitely. But first, talk about Art to Action, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Art to Action is a, a, a coalitional project, in a way. It's um, designed to support artists who identify as people of color within a U.S. framework, uh, as well as queer identified artists and women uh, artists who are leading ambitious projects. And um, it's really uh, constructed as a kind of response to the system, the systemic inequities in the arts field that are of course a microcosm of the nation at large um, and our impact globally as well. Um, so it's not, even though I'm an Arab American identified artist, it's not an Arab American identified organization because I think my queer identity is as important and has shaped me as much as my Arab identity. Um, and in fact, I often feel, I often say I, it was easier to come out as queer than it was to come out as Arab in a post 9-11 America, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so I, you know, so I really, I, I really have always been interested in movement building and the, the ways that we can learn from each other's movements, the history of uh, in, incredible uh, movements, um, you know, civil rights movements, so the movement for Black Lives in the United States, um, it, it, it movements for indigeneity and land back movements and um, the ways that various immigrant communities and communities of color in a U.S. framework have um, have uh, have art, art and cultural expression has been a part of uh, movements for change pretty much since this nation became a nation. So, uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in that and I'm interested in how uh, Middle Eastern theater makers in the framework that we're using or, or people with ancestry in Southwest, Central Asia and North Africa can learn from the movements that have come before us and how we can connect and build together and break this, I'm trying not to cuss, isolation that we have felt. Uh, for so long, and I think the way the way forward is through coalition building and collective voice, and uh, and understanding uh, in a way to what Heather was speaking to that um, we're all actually fighting the same systems, the same systems of militarism, white supremacy, uh, patriarchy that came with colonialism. Uh, imperialism that is rooted in colonialism. We're, we're actually all reeling from the same systemic patterns. And if we can see that, then we can build more power together than we can apart. So anyway, so I basically, uh, Art to Action is a, is a platform for me to invest in artists who are doing that. And, uh, you know, say, uh, see what people are doing and say, you're amazing, I, that should be supported. And if, if like the mainstream of our theater community doesn't get it, uh, let's see if Art to Action can leverage some money to make it happen and, uh, or to be a partner in helping make it happen. So that's, that's really what, what Art to Action is about. And it's also a platform for my own work as well. So uh, in addition to commissioning, developing, and supporting uh, the work of other artists, um, my work is in the mix too. So <laughs> uh, it's a way for me to do community-based and socially engaged work in places like 
where I live, Tampa, Florida, like as Heather was saying, also a swing state and truly a battleground against fascism right now. Um, and that feels important. It sometimes feels more important than being in New York or California, uh, where audiences are kind of politically more homogenized, right? Um, in places like Florida, there's actually the potential that an artistic work or engagement with an artist can move the needle on a conversation in a really important way. And, and, I'm, and I'm interested in that too, as much as I also like tour around and do work wherever and with, with incredible organizations all over the country, which leads me to 11 Reflections on the Nation. So, uh, you know, so I started, uh, first I started with a solo show called 11 Reflections on September that was really just uh, gathering pieces of poetry and spoken word that I'd written since 9-11 and saying, you know, for my very New York spoken word aesthetic, what would happen if I collaborate with Middle Eastern musicians and see what we can make together and made this kind of very hybrid multimedia piece that toured around for a while. And then um, and then during the pandemic, we, we had an opportunity uh, supported by the Carver Community Cultural Center in San Antonio to turn it into a digital production which was really like one of those things when, you know, as a good, as a well-trained theater artist, someone says, hey, could you make this into a digital piece? You say, yes, I can. What does that mean? I'll figure it out. <laughs> and I like accidentally made an experimental art film that is now like got 20 official selections in international film festivals around the country. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Um, but actually, uh, then I started feeling like, uh, yeah, that that was that was therapeutic for me to um, rant on stage for many years and collaborate with these amazing artists. However, my voice is particular and not enough at all. We're not remotely enough right now in the in the political moment that we're in. Right. So, eleven reflections on the nation is about. How can I um, go around the country using the, the the instigating the initial work as a kind of instigator to ask lo locally based artists and communities in each location what is the impact of the the policies that followed 9/11 this post 9/11 era in your community I know what it was in New York I lived it in New York but I don't know what it was in Texas or California or, and how do, how do we create a platform to talk about that? And so it's certainly how it's impacted MENA or SWANA communities, uh, of course, um, everything from, you know, the wars to the Muslim ban and, uh, it, but also how 9-11 and the policies that were created after impacted our entire immigration system impacted our entire electoral system. It impacted the way that the US is participating in proxy wars now, right? So that those are the questions I'm interested in. So I you know, go around the country and I look for a partner. I'm very excited to be partnering with Golden Thread here in San Francisco uh, next season on a San Francisco version with, uh, with Brava and some other partners. Uh, and we did this in San Antonio and, and eventually it'll make its way back to New York, but I want to, but I want to gather these stories around the country first and hear, hear the voices of, you know, like, for example, in San Antonio, Arab and Muslim communities are very isolated in that city. Um, there really wasn't, you know, um, there wasn't a, a way for people to gather in a public venue like a theater venue like we we had a, a an artist who participated who had an Iraqi musician had an entire 10 year career uh on in Turkey as a as a celebrated musician on television came to Texas and hadn't been on a stage since he arrived in the United States and I mean extraordinary musician and nobody understood that he was right there in Texas right and so I'm really interested in those uh, not only the gathering the stories of the community, but 
where are our artists? What has displacement done to our artists, right? In the in the wake of the Iraq War, in the wake of uh, the war in Afghanistan, in the in the forces that are driving mo global migration that Heather's working on right now, right? With the new migration play cycle that she's doing. Um, so that's what Eleven Reflections on the Nation is about, and um, the idea is then to take some of the strongest pieces that are devised out of that process around the country and bring it back to New York for the 25th anniversary of 9-11 to really ask the question, how do we commemorate? How do we remember tragedy and whose voices are left out and whose voices matter? Uh, and, and so that's the, that's the project, that's the intention. Wow, thank you so much. It sounds incredible, truly. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, I thought there might be some questions from attendees, but I'm not seeing any. Um, I wonder if this is a moment uh, where you, the panelists, might either tell us something that I haven't asked you about that you would like to share, or do you have a question for one of the other panelists based on what they've been talking about? I'm just curious. Ah, so there are people uh, in person, attendees, who can come up to the mic. Great. Is anyone eager to ask a question? I see the mic, but I don't see people moving toward it. And so we're going to keep moving on. Um, and, and panelists, you're going to say if there's anything else you'd like to share or if you have a question for each other. I had a question. Are you curious? Yes, I had um which is i guess um, maybe a little bit more for for well not maybe this is more for those of us who are in the us but um i've been coming up against this wall a lot for the last 22 days that i guess i wanted to ask if if you all have had to navigate in the past for advice um where i feel like partially maybe because of our backgrounds and what we grew up with we have a tendency to 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 feel more satisfied by our work when it quote unquote engages whatever that means to you um and i feel like i keep coming up against this wall where in the face of sort of structural racism in this country i keep getting asked if i'm so bothered by the politics here why don't i just leave um which which I think is horrifically undemocratic and and actually quite unpatriotic, whatever that means as well. But um, I was wondering if, if if you've had to navigate that where you where you're sort of told that your political opinions about the way this country is operating are lesser than because of your backgrounds. I would say personally, if I may, and, and then, yeah, I just want to say that I don't know that anyone expressed, you know, a, a, an argument with my political views because of my background, due to my background. First of all, I grew up in a different, completely different era from everyone else here. And uh, my family was pretty assimilated. And plus, my name doesn't give me away, which is so weird. But it's actually Huri, and you probably knew this. But um, I think that in general, in my youth, because of my political views, I was often told, you know, that if uh, if I was unhappy, that I should just, I, I should leave. And that's without even knowing that I came from an immigrant family, you know, as though... And I was raised in a house where, yeah, yeah, you say what you think because that is the democratic process. So I did experience that, not necessarily be due to my ethnic background. Andrea. Yeah, um, I, you know, I like to remind people that dissent and rebellion is like the most American thing ever. <laughs> like all of our, all of our narratives are about that, right? Um, and I also like to remind European descended folks that they are immigrants on this land. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, literally on a panel once at like a national arts conference and a white man next to me said, well, you know, I'm not an immigrant. I was like, really, Mr. White Man? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, because I think, you know, again, it's about narrative. It's about the narrative. Who's shaping the narrative? Who's otherized by it? What are we acknowledging in American history, U.S. history? And what are we normalized? What's being normalized in those kind of comments, right? Um, so the why don't you leave? Uh, also, we, there is no there is almost no place on the globe that the US doesn't touch now. Where do you, where to go that the US does not have a hand in, right? And so I think that this, this it, the belly of the beast is the place that maybe, maybe we can make change. I will say one thing, which is that my Lebanese uncle would give me a hard time because he would say I was lucky to be here. He would go on and on about that. Yeah. Heather. Yeah, I would say that one one aspect of that that I find really interesting is that um, um and my daughter helped define this for me. She's like, the new the new cancel, this is from her talking about her first month in high school, right? Is um you is the new cancel is so polite because nobody wants to be racist or this or anything. So it's just like, you just get passed by, right? And I said, I, when she was describing this to me as a high school, I went, well, that's not so new. Like, I mean, the the idea that like, there just isn't a place for you, right? So the fact that somebody's even saying go home, like I'm really interested in that because I'm like, oh, are they engaging with actually offering you something? Because my experience is like, nothing's really on offer, <laughs> right? So you're kind of like, in what space will you, will you work or can you work? And then the flip side of that is that the places on offer can be in, aren't necessarily in communities where the conversation is still hot. It's, this is a gross generalization, but let's just say eh, it's in New York. How, how hot is the conversation in New York? Everybody's so liberal, everybody's right. You can be racially diverse, but not politically diverse. So like, like how to even make space in communities where the conversation can be heated, right? So I, I don't know, that's, it's just a that's just some of the stuff I was feeling when you asked that is like um my experience is you usually just get passed by and you don't get to be in conversation with the why of it, but that the the um the way of engaging in places where it really matters and is of most use to you. Um I don't know. I'm not finishing my thought on that. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just navigating um, how hard it is to find spaces to work, right? Like, and this idea that any invitation is genuine is, is rare. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anything else? I have a, I have a, I have a random thing. Um, and this is, I think, due to the title of this talk. Um, so it's not a, it's a, it's a wonder more than it is a question of, um, there has, there is rarely work in translation. You know that done on our stages, Catherine, and you've you've championed that and tried to make it happen. Um, and the the I'm wondering where where one can create opportunities for um, Middle Eastern American artists to work alongside artists from the Middle East in institutions either here or elsewhere. That is a, um, that's a collaboration I've yet to have fully and would love to see happen more, at least across this country. Well, Heather, since you brought it up, um, though I cannot provide all the details, 
um, keep your ears open for a project that I'm doing with the Newer Theater uh, in Lebanon in September of 2024 that will actually address those very questions and desires. So more on that soon. I also want to um, say, like, I, I, I'm really interested in multilingual work and especially through music and poetry. And I am wondering sometimes how much needs to be translated. <laughs> like there's, there's something that in me that enjoys that the bilingual or multilingual audience member gets the most out of it and is the privileged audience member, right? Instead of the mon monolingual English speaker. And so um, I'm really looking for the like both and in that, like how do we make the translations available so that people can deeply understand the poetry and music that is coming out of the Middle Eastern texts, but at the same time, maybe in the live experience, that isn't uh, what I want to privilege in the space, in the in the in the time of experiencing it. Like, what is it to experience the poetry and music that isn't explained to you in a language you already know? And so, I I, I want it all. I guess is what I'm saying. I want all. Oh, well, Andrea, Andrea, you just you'll never be satisfied. I know it's true. It's <laughs> right? Can I be shameless for a second here? Well, well um, we have a question from the audience, Hamid, and uh, since uh, we begged them to ask uh, questions, but I think we should give somebody Heather. the opportunity. What's your question? Not a question, but an answer to Heather. This is Wafa Bilal. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, there you go. Hello. Hello, Wafa. Hello, Heather. Uh, this is Wafa Bilal. I'm an Iraqi artist, Iraqi-American artist, and I do have uh, an answer for you. I hear you on the microphone. Uh, I've been working with the Golden Threat for a year now and on a residency here. And the answer is I'm working with Sahar here on um, a residency for a theater uh, people from Iraq and here in the Golden Threat uh, to answer the question, where do Middle Eastern uh, uh, go to collaborate with people in the United States? So we are in the process of finalizing that collaboration. And our hope is to connect people in the Middle East to Golden Threat and to the people who are in the theater business in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. I was gonna uh, add something to, to that, to both, I mean, Heather and Andrea, that um, so I'm, I've kind of been grappling with this question a lot for the last couple of years. And the 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 opera that I'm working on for January, a third of it is in Arabic. Um and it it really does matter to me that that something within discourse around opera comes out in a language that is not German, Italian, French, or English, right? Um and so that's been like really sort of tricky to navigate. And there are parts, Andrea, in which like, there's a part where I sing a muwil, which for me is actually a very loaded form because it's something that I resisted very actively when I was in Beirut because it, you know, I associated it to everything that was conservative and sort of bogging me down while I was there. And on coming here, it sort of felt like a weird kind of surrender. And I think that will not translate to anyone except the bilingual people in the audience. Well, it's specifically except the bilingual immigrants in the audience. Um, and so there are parts in which I'm not translating the Arabic um, to English, but everything that is in English is translated to Arabic in the in the subtitles, basically the projections on stage. Um, but yeah, no, it's like it's a crazy question, and I feel like it's so it's so meaty, and there's so much room to play there, and to to sort of really sort of kick at things, and it's it's very exciting. You know, I've had so many plays translated, and. Um... And we've had workshops, as Heather knows, uh, and readings and, you know, um, some of the, I, I just need to point out that some of the organizations that were focused on work in translation and on really connecting with playwrights uh, in the Middle East and beyond um, have shut their doors for one reason or another. And the organization that I worked with for many years, which was the LARC, uh, I was the director of Middle East Exchange there. And that was the mission um, not only with the Middle East, but uh, yeah, with uh, Eastern Europe and Mexico and, you know, um, 
and it was a thriving uh, organization for a long time. And uh, I, we need to rebuild. That's that's my take on the situation in terms of creating exchanges. And uh, you know, I'm working on it. Um, anybody care to join me? Just let me know. Um, but meanwhile, we are at time, and uh, you know, I just I can't thank you all enough for just sharing so much with us. It's very meaningful for me and I'm sure to for anyone who was listening in. Um, I wanna thank HowlRound for hosting the live stream program. I hope people did tune in that way. Uh, as a reminder, the panel will be archived on HowlRound's website soon, yes. So please feel free to share it with uh, people who couldn't make it today. And uh, thank you. And um, I hope that people will be able to um, join Manatma for the remaining sessions. And uh, with that, I say good afternoon from Washington Heights. Thank you. Catherine. Thank you.